These are the pictures, the symbols of the Soviet Union you usually see, in part because the news media have been restricted in what we can show you here. When we at ABC try for different images, the Soviets often stop us. No, no, no! Don't do that. So now they're going to let dozens of Western photographers take pictures all across their country? The Russians are as much amazed by this as we are. They can't believe themselves the access that has been given, and they're as frightened as, of this whole thing as we are. Cohen and Rick Smolin are the creators of a series of Day in the Life books. The last one, A Day in the Life of America, is a publishing phenomenon. It's on its 29th week in the bestseller list. Making the American book was a massive project. Armies of photographers spread throughout the country to shoot all on one day. Hard enough to arrange here. Could it be done in the Soviet Union? Smolin and Cohen started asking for permission three years ago. The Russians didn't respond. They asked the next year and the year after that. And they would come around and say, uh, thank you very much, uh, we'll get back in touch with you, and we would never hear anything. But it really wasn't until Gorbachev came to power and that this was even possible at all. And it was Glasnost makes such things possible. In London, last February, the final deal was struck between the Day in the Life publishers and Novosti, a Soviet government news agency. Among the conditions, 100 photographers would be allowed to shoot for the project, 50 from the Soviet bloc, 50 from the West. Last month, a contingent from the West arrived at Moscow's airport. It was five days before shoot day, May 15th. Among them, Pulitzer Prize winners like David Kennerly and Eddie Adams. They and their colleagues are some of the best in the business of photojournalism. Most of them would soon leave Moscow by car, train, and aeroflot to spread out all over the Soviet Union's 11 time zones, visiting 83 different cities, many shooting places which were off limits to foreigners until now. We couldn't follow them all because the Soviets limited ABC's cameras to three cities. Fortunately, Sony, one of the sponsors of the book, gave each photographer a portable video camera. So for much of this report, you'll see their home movies, movies of places most of us have never heard about. I'm going to a town uh, about 1,200 miles southeast of Moscow called Polyadi. It's the Pittsburgh of, of Russia. A place called Vilzny Garodok, which I don't know if that's how you say it, but it stands for Star City. It's in the middle of Siberia. It's called Yakutsk. And they say it's the coldest place on Earth. No one's ever been there. No one knows anything about it, but it's a part of the Soviet Union that no American has ever been to. May 15th, shoot day, begins in the Far East. Frank Johnston of the Washington Post is in the Hudka, a major commercial fishing port in the Sea of Japan, to record the sunrise. Over 4,000 miles away, in Moscow, the sun rises seven hours later. And at 5 a.m., Pulitzer Prize winner Larry Price is in Red Square to catch it. This, by the way, is where that young German pilot landed his Cessna just two weeks later. Later that day, at Moscow's public bath, group portrait specialist Neil Slavin found this group revealing. What I'm most fascinated by is the total relaxation, the total sense of anonymity. You know, you've got little kids, you've got old men. I mean, everybody comes here. Everybody. This is, this is just a way of life. Some people take the phrase public baths quite literally. Others use the place just to relax or to go for a swim. And take it from me, this is a nice way to spend the day. At Moscow's famous outdoor swimming pool, project director Rick Smolin became photographer Smolin. The Soviets say this is the world's biggest pool. It exists only because Stalin once tried to put up a government building here, but the foundation kept sinking. So he gave up and built the pool. At the Centralny Market that morning, I found Sarah Lean of the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the 12 photographers assigned to Moscow. This market is one of those experiments in free enterprise. Farmers bring in their own animals and produce, sell it themselves, and keep the profit. There's a better selection than in state stores, and no lines because the prices are much higher. I paid more than a dollar for these radishes and two dollars for a mealy apple. I, mean, I, I don't understand what you're saying, but it certainly does.
does look like good sauerkraut. No, America, America. America, America. America. That same morning, Matthew Nathan found an even bigger free enterprise market in Kiev, not far from Chernobyl. Kiev is the capital of the Ukraine, one of the USSR's most fertile regions. At this point, I should make it clear that Nathan didn't just find this place as he might have found something wandering through a town, shooting a day in the life of America. Now, the big difference in preparing this book is that in this country, you can't just go places and take pictures. First, you get permission, and then when you go, you go with a guide. We were never alone. That's very clear. And anyone who thinks that we were alone and we were allowed to wander freely is terribly naive. Now, most of the government guides were helpful. Thank you very much. Translating, for example. Thank you. But having guides does change things. Their presence was felt. I was photographing some students outside a monument in Kiev. I was alone. I was photographing them. They were laughing and giggling. My guide walked up, a nice man, and they froze. You could see them freeze. And I would, I some would photographers had two guides. The one that came with me was after Glasnost, and the guy there was pre-Glasnost. So, uh, but we convinced him, and we, we turned him into a into an after Glasnost man. Diego Goldberg of Buenos Aires was in Yakutsk, a part of Siberia where in winter it gets down to 70 below. And it wasn't very warm on May 15th while Goldberg photographed these Siberian ponies. And this spring ritual, an icebreaker working on the Lena River. The cargo ships, and they're trapped in the, in the ice and they spend the winter there. There's an icebreaker that at this time of year starts uh, bringing the ice to open a path, the canal towards the river. Star City, the Space Research Center, opened its doors to a Western photographer for the first time. Roger Restmeyer found tight security and uptight officials, but he says it's like shooting at NASA. He got his shot. These cosmonauts are practicing weightlessness by floating in water. Very few Westerners have ever been allowed into Star City, and I, I knew that we had to take what they would give us and make sure we didn't compromise it. Now, there's another problem with trying to shoot photographs in this country. Soviet scholars say the Russian people have always been suspicious of foreigners. This isn't something that just began with communism. Even in the days of the Tsar, there was a fear that outsiders would portray them as backward or unsophisticated. They've never liked reporters. So, just because the government now says it's okay, does that mean the people will cooperate? Don't hide. Come on. In most cases, they did. On shoot day, Nicole Benjavino of the New York Daily News was one of four photographers assigned to Leningrad, the country's second largest city. The thing that was so nice is that I just felt like people were very happy that I was here. Many people knew about the Day in the Life project. There'd been lots of publicity about it in the Soviet press. Still, when Nicole tried to shoot a baby That's Soviet that. boxer... <laughs> seemed to me a harmless thing to be photographing. A Russian man had a pre-Glasnost reaction to her camera. Once he, he found out what we were doing, he immediately said, oh yes, that's fine. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> That morning in Nova Sibirsk, smack in the middle of the country, Douglas Kirkland met resistance too, when he started taking pictures at the Trans-Siberian Railroad Station. What they call the militia or the police uh, challenged us quite strongly, again, on photographing in the railway station. The rules say no pictures of trains, airports, even bridges. Why? Because they might provide details that could help an enemy invade. These rules are kind of pointless in an age of spy satellites, but the old rules persist until they hear the new rule. When we produce these papers or these badges that have been given to us, uh, people almost uh, are fearful of getting into trouble for maybe blocking us in any way. And uh, in the case of the police or militia, they ended up saluting. Another place off limits until now was the elite Naval Academy in Leningrad. Again, when you go inside, you wonder, what was so secret? It's just teenagers in school. But Time Magazine's David Kennerly was the first Western photographer ever. The man who ran the uh, uh, naval school 
uh, an admiral who's a, the, a hero of the Soviet <laughs> Union just greased the whole thank thing. You, uh, they knew what I wanted to do. Uh, they got caught up in the spirit of this whole project. Near the Chinese border in Alma-Ata, Frenchman Jean-Pierre Lafont started his day by capturing a moving event. I did uh, my first picture. It was uh, midnight, just 10 minutes after midnight. I was in a little clinic. <laughs> and I photographed a little baby coming. I guess the first baby of the day in the life of Russia. We are about two hours driving away from uh, Almata. I don't know where, southwest. I guess west. While he was out in the country, he photographed a capitalist-type farmer. He told me that the field belonged to him. So this is a new reform of the new political agricultural reform of this country. It was 8.30 at night, and the farmer was still working. He did a fortune last year. He did uh, 1,200 rubles a month profit. That's about $2,000, more than six times the average monthly wage. A republic away in Tolyaki, photographer Jerry Valenti spent all of shoot day at a model auto plant, built with the help of the Italian auto company, Fiat. A huge, 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 a huge plant. Huge buildings, huge machinery. 35 or 40,000 people work there. They make the car called Alada, L-A-D-A. They export to 85 countries in this world. 85 countries. Um, there aren't many Russians who buy the who buy the car. They're mostly foreign, mostly foreign sales. His assignment included the plant's daycare center. And as soon as they found out I'm the American, happy to see me and talking and giggly and they wanted to touch me and, and touch my face and the beard and whatever, an American in the flesh from 9,000 miles away, no anti-Americanism at all. That's terrific, but he was accompanied by six people. Two guides, an interpreter, two or three PR people from the plant, all going with me all the time while I was shooting, constantly. It was like photography by committee. Valenti got the pictures he wanted, but it makes one wonder, is this honest photojournalism? Eugene Zikoff helped run the project for Novosti. In the America book, there are pictures that show the bad side of America. There are pictures of the Ku Klux Klan. That's one, one picture. One picture, true. There are pictures of poverty. There is poverty in the Soviet Union. No. Oh, come on. There's, there's no oh, poverty in this country? Well, let's go out in the streets. How many, how many homeless people did you see there? Did you see any single person sleeping outside in the, in the garden? But if there is no poverty and no are no homeless people, why can we not go and look to see for ourselves? Uh, because there are certain restrictions in the area, some, some areas are considered to be closed. I reminded him that closed areas make American journalists more curious. We reporters like to look in the closet. Well, sometimes, unfortunately. That's a different school of journalism. You have your own um, ethics, journalism. Sorry, sorry about that. The Soviets prefer nice pictures in Alista in the Kalmuk Republic between the Caspian and Black Seas, Anne Day found herself treated like an honored guest. They're very, very nice. But every place I went, they'd whip out the costumes and do the ethnic dances. Small children this size doing the dances, and there was the preteens doing the dances, and there were the teenagers doing the dances. There's some wonderful dancing by a fire at the shepherd's house. He invited the whole, all of his, um, his relatives and his friends. She found it impossible to photograph natural light until she was invited to a local kindergarten where 35 children were asleep. And it was the only pictures where nobody posed. I think they didn't want to insult me by um, showing me anything that wasn't sort of model or perfect. So the easiest part is done. Now is the most difficult to choose the right pictures. At the end, we will see a good book. Thank you. Yes, a good book. However the book turns out, it was a remarkable shoot. ABC News is a full-time Moscow bureau. Yet in years of trying, we have never been given the access the day in the life soon got. On May 15th, a closed society opened itself to Westerners in a way it had never done before. I would have loved to have caught a little bit more off guard or had the feeling that I walked into something unexpectedly. But uh, at the same time, I understand why they would want to show their best side. It's sort of a natural thing, especially for a big book, to think that the whole world might see.
you had an interesting reaction to Moscow. Has Glasnost done anything to there to please you? Well, not not for me. I just had a miserable time. That the, the people I met I met were just not friendly, were surly to me as an American. The air was polluted. The cars don't have pollution control. All these rules and regulations. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I sang on the airplane as it well, took off. <laughs> I, when I was there, I noticed some unfriendliness, but I always had the feeling it was a function of a, being a big city. Because when I got out of Moscow, particularly in Siberia, the people are wonderful. They're and nice certainly the photographers who left town had wonderful experiences. Yeah. But I live in New York, which is a big city, and, and I found Moscow much more oppressive. I had a feeling that maybe people f thought they might have to fill out something in quintuplicate if they were friendly to a Westerner. But uh, it really was just uh, Moscow. I didn't find it that I way otherwise. So. When can we expect to see the results of all these photographers doing a day in the life? They're still sorting out the photographs. They should have the book out this fall, and we'll have a report on it then. We'll look forward to your report then, John. Thank you, Mike.